this was waiting when man came into the highlands. First, the Cherokee Indian, then the Spaniard hunting treasure, then the Scotch-Irish, German, and Huguenot settlers in search of home sites. They came nearly 200 years ago, cleared the wilderness to build log cabins, fought the forest for cropland, then settled down, walled in from the rest of the world. This is the story of their descendants, people who still live by simple, honest values in a world grown complicated all around them. The man who never strays from the highway will never learn the story or know the soul of the highlands. It lies farther back in homes hidden deep in the hollow and in the classroom of a mountain school. At half past three on a school day afternoon, the mountains call to the children of the Southern Highlands. The quiet old hills are jealous of schools and school teachers. I know, because I grew up in these mountains. I teach with textbook and blackboard, but the mountain uses magic and charm. In my sight, these children are the hope of a better future for the South. The mountain wants them to listen to the music of tumbling rivers and get their feet tangled in a laurel slick. But because they are mountain children, they'll listen to me and to the mountain too, and keep the best of each. A hill child starts life with just about what his father and grandfather had. Pure air, pure water, and a far view from the front porch of his father's house. These things he doesn't have to work for. But everything else, he pays for in toil. He starts early. Courage, pride, and love of freedom are strong in his blood. Those same qualities led his forefathers into the mountain wilderness nearly two centuries ago. They battled the forest of their cornfields and took steady aim down the long barrel of a rifle when they needed meat for the table. They came from Scotland and Ireland, mostly. Clannish people, with dry humor and gunpowder tempers. Sentimental, too. Lovers of song and respecters of God. That's why their hearts melted when they saw the green giants of the Highlands. They were humbled, the way we are today. Ben Blair put it in words last Sunday when I saw him just before church. Well, uh, I'll tell you, I think a man back here in these mountains enjoys himself just about as much as any people there is on earth living. There's nothing to bother him much, and he can serve the Lord. All this land of ours don't belong to us. It belongs to our Maker. And he has got control of it all. If he gives us the rain and the sunshine and the seed, well, we have good crops. And I think that's the greatest thing in life that could be handed down to us, is just to live for the Lord while we're here and invite to get to a better world over yonder.
kill people started with what they found. They cut logs to build cabins and split shingles to cover the roofs. Then they settled down, locked in the mountains for a century and a half. It's no wonder today's children are close to the old ways. Sometimes very close. In all his days, John McDowell has never had a spoonful of white sugar on his table. His daddy left him a sorghum press, and he makes his own sweetening. John himself feeds the sorghum cane into the press, and his old mare has been circling round John as long as I can remember. I had to smile when he told me the press was botched on from an iron foundry way yonder in Ohio. And it was 20 days of coming while she rode the last spell on the back of a mule critter. John's wife, Lucy, strains the squeezing through a patch of burlap. She makes the best cornbread for miles around, and her man makes the best sweetening. steam rises up like mist off a mountain and sweetens the air in the clearing. John's brother, Herman, stirs the sweet juice while it boils in the pan and gets thicker by the stir. <laughs> Makes me almighty hungry when I'm near it. If a man wanted a chair to sit on, he made it himself. And his womenfolk wove the seats from corn shucks. The hill woman made all the family's clothes. Time was when store-bought things flooded the mountains and folks were ashamed to own homemade things. Then the tourists came into the highlands and carried on about the old-timey quilts and the home-forged ironwork. So, the loom and the forge came back to life. I like to see the shuttle and the bellows in the hands of a mountain girl or boy, because I know there's a naturalness in it. And it's something they'll always remember. The way they'll remember the easy-come rhythm of an old-fashioned mountain square dance. Big ring, circle there! to the southern highlands, the hum of electric generators echoing back into the farthest valley. Men harness the rivers and strung wires across the peaks and valleys, bringing cheap power to a land of kerosene lamps and long back muscles. Power for new industries, new jobs for people of the hills. The music came too late for the old and weary but it's a tonic for young people just starting out. Sue White told me last week she means to buy an electric stove for her new kitchen.
Sue is kindly persistent when she sets her heart on something. Her daughter is too, I know. She's one of my pupils. New ideas in farming came along with the power lines and light bulbs. A mountain farmer years ago planted according to spells of the moon. When his land wore out, he cleared some more. He knew there was something wrong, but that was the way his father did it. All that is changing. Now he can talk things over with a county farm agent and the federal government's farm advisor. He learns how to grow tobacco, how to start the young plants in a sunny patch and harvest the crop in the early fall. Tobacco puts cash in his pocket for necessities that he can't grow or build. He hears about plowing a furrow along the contours of a sloping land so the rain won't wash away the good topsoil. And he lets machines do more and more of his work. That way he gets more done and doesn't feel so tired when the sun goes down. He learns the sense of rotating crops, growing cover crops to be plowed under, so the soil he farms today will be rich and sweet for his sons. It used to be that a tree was cut down if it was in the way. Now the Highland farmer protects his woodlot and thinks of his lumber as a crop. It's a new idea with him. He takes care of the forest, and the forest takes care of him. These proud old mountains have a way of strutting over us and bossing us around. But we're beginning to talk back now. Every chance I get, I go and visit with kinfolk of youngsters I have in school. Because old and young, I try to make them understand that we've all got to go along together if we're going to get anywhere at all. Our people love this land. They mean to stay here until the mountains tumble into the valleys but they need no longer be slaves to the mountains if they listen to the music of the future, the hum of dynamos and the song of machines. A poet once said that something in a hill child dies when he goes down to level land. We all know that the Highlands are a little bit poorer for every child who goes away from them. My dream is to make life worth the struggle in the Highlands. That's why I feel easy in my mind when night comes on the mountains and I hear my neighbor singing the old ballads to his grandchildren. In a summer morning, are still up here and then are gone. Do you remember yon green mountain, where you and I first fell in love? The little birds would sing so sweetly. And I know a good man is helping me make my dream come true. Helping me hold the hearts of these young Americans closer and closer to home. <laughs>